engagement. It's uh, beautiful, so we can all learn together. If you remember, because we didn't have Bible study last week, so two weeks ago, we're talking about what? Very important topic. And everyone's engaged in it. And I hope everyone's going to be engaged tonight. Then. Good wife. Yes, yeah, see, I knew people are not going to forget this topic. A good wife, okay? And we said this is important for the, uh, as a checklist for the uh, men looking for a, a virtuous wife, as the Bible calls it, a virtuous wife or virtuous woman. And good for the girls so they know what God is telling them how to be a virtuous, um, a virtuous wife or a virtuous woman. And this is a beautiful thing to actually follow the checklist in the Bible. Why? Because the world gives us a different checklist. Okay? So when we look at the, what the world criteria of selecting a good wife will be different from what God is trying to tell us the right way to do it. And that's the importance of reading the Bible, the Word of God, knowing what God's intention when it comes to things like that. This is very important decisions that, you know, someone makes in their life and choosing a wife or choosing a husband hi girls so this is a very important decision as we said then that's why we need to do it according to god's will according to god's way how he wants us to do it and having said that it doesn't mean that you know this is you know uh, the only thing this is this is a nice comprehensive list but obviously there's many other things that we need to take into account and consider so just quickly, we'll read it again, Proverbs 31 from verse 10 to the end, to people who are not here last time so they can know what we're talking about. And to get us started again, we'll go through quickly some of the main points we talked about last time as a refresher, and then we'll continue um, the rest. So can someone read for us, or maybe different people can read from Proverbs 31 from verse 10 until the end, please. The Father and Son, the Holy Spirit, and God, Amen. The heart of her husband safely trusts her, so he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She sees she seeks wool and flax and willingly works with her hands. She is like to the merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She also rises while it is yet night and provides food for her hus household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. From her profit, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her mer merchandise is good and her lamp does not go out by night. She stretches out her hand to the distaff and her hand holds the spindle. Spindle. She extends her hands to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow of her household, for all her household is clothed with scarlet. She makes tapestry for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies sashes for the merchants. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own work praise her in the gates. last week last time but i want to again quick review what are the main things we said what are the main um virtues of that good woman that we're talking about the main things from what we've just read now we said it last week but just as a as a reminder the microphone here so this microphone for this side sarah we just have it so if someone wants to use it they can just give it to them so from what we just read, what can you pick the virtues of a good wife? Wisdom, okay, excellent, wisdom. And we can see from verses here, talk about when she talks, words of wisdom comes out of her mouth, excellent. Or very caring, how do you know that?
Okay, very good caring, takes care of the household, the kids, the maid servants. Excellent, very good. What other characteristics of virtues? Kind. How do you know that? Use the microphone, please, for the use the microphone, Sarah. Yes, sir, please keep the passing the microphone around. Whoever's talking, just pass the microphone to them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. Wisdom and kindness. That's right. So in the same verse about wisdom and kindness. Excellent. What else? How do you know that? <coughs> um, because oh, yeah. that's for the girls. Sarah tainted it. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, because she, she's she can she's never to be idle. Excellent. She's, she's never to be idle, so she's always busy. She's always preoccupied. So she's not lazy. And in one verse it said, she gets up while it's still dark. So gets up early in the morning, she does the chores. Excellent. What else? What other virtues we get out of this? Excellent. So she's generous and she uh, extends a hand to the poor. So she gives. So charity. Excellent. Trustworthy. How do you know that? Excellent. Very good. That's a very important virtue. And I don't think we said that last time, did we? I don't think we actually said that. That's a good uh, that you picked it up. Okay. She has the trust of her husband. That's very important because any relationship that doesn't have trust breaks down. Okay. So that trust is so important for a healthy relationship. Okay. Excellent. What else? Washing, does it say that? <coughs> uh, okay. She's good. Uh, what else? We said... Um, <coughs> definitely. And that's what it says here. It says the fear of those. And mentions throughout different... Even after we talk about the virtues, it talks about the fear of the Lord. Okay? Excellent. Definitely. She has the fear of the Lord. That's, that's, that's why she has all these other virtues. Because it comes from... And that's the whole point. So you're taking us now to the end... Well, I'll, I'll talk about it. Remember, we've been talking about the fear of the Lord and the fear of that's the whole fear of the Lord is central to that whole book of pro of um, of uh, Proverbs and wisdom of Sirach as well, the fear of the Lord. So, this all these virtues that we're talking about is as a result that she fears the Lord. So, a woman who fears the Lord will have these virtues as a result of the fear of the Lord. Okay, and this is the importance of a. Um, a good wife, is she has to start with the fear of the Lord. And because she has the fear of the Lord in her heart, then she will do these things. That will come naturally. Okay? So she'll be trustworthy. She'll be generous. She'll be patient. She'll be a hard worker. She'll, she'll, she'll be the trustworthy of her husband. She will be wise. She'll have courage. You know? She'll be in making decisions, planning. Those verses about her doing what? You know? She's a businesswoman. Remember we said last time? Where can you anyone pick the verse, talk about she does business? Yeah, that's right. She goes and buys things and, and plans things. She's actually thinking ahead. She's actually a businesswoman. Okay? So she can see that someone who's well-rounded. We can see from that that someone who's well-rounded has all these beautiful virtues as, as a good wife. Okay? What else did you pick from this Proverbs 31? Which one, sorry? Which verse? <coughs> she girds herself with strength and strengthen her arms. Someone last week said she goes to the gym. <laughs> I don't think that's um, that's a, that's a right interpretation from it. But I think she basically surrounds herself with things that gives her strength. What does that mean? You know, you know when you surround yourself with the people that strengthen you, give you, motivate you, or give you strength? She's positive. Okay? Someone who surrounds themselves to give them strength. Someone who's not negative. A lot of, a lot of people are negative, and that impacts a relationship. You know? You, know, you know, you say, a man say, my wife is negative. You know, she's, 
you know, she's on the depressed side and, and is not motivated and, you know, pulls you down. But this one, she pulls you up. She gives strength. You know, this type of people, when you talk to them, they motivate you. They actually, you feel there's a positive energy coming out of from them and they motivate you and they keep you uh, motivated. But I think that's what they're trying to talk about here. Okay. What else? There's a lot of things we can learn from this. So I'd love to get it from you guys. Exactly. You can see here. 25, uh, 28. 20, 28. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her <laughs> husband also, and he praises her. Okay. Can you see the impact of a virtuous wife? She gains the praise and the love and the respect of all her family. Okay. And I'm sure we know people like that, that they're well loved by everyone, and people respect her, and people actually praise her. I'm going to go into examples of, of women in the Bible who have some of these characteristics, and we'll talk about them quickly, but after we finish this. When, when you tell me that you've done, you can't get anything out of this. Any more things you extracted from that, guys? Excellent, beautiful. That's right. And it says here, I'm trying to find the verse that you're talking about. Verse 23. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. So you can see that he's a, a proud husband. You know, she gives him the sense that, you know, um, he's proud that this is his wife. Can you, can you see what he's trying to say? He sits there with people and with the elders of the land and he is actually feeling that this is, you know, I'm proud that this is my wife. Okay? Does it sound good? Sounds very ideal, do you think? Do you think a woman can, pos can have all these virtues in, in one person? Do you think it's possible? What do you think? Because it sounds like, a, you know, a, a perfect person, a well-rounded person. Do you think it's possible in, in real life? What do you think? Yeah, you think? So you're looking. Okay. Hmm. Excellent. Okay. But what about what about beauty? Did it mention anything about her beauty, what she looks like, her body, her figure, anything to do with that stuff? Yeah, let's look at uh, verse 30. It says, charm is deceitful and beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. See that key here, okay? So, so wh what is that verse saying? This verse is a summary of a beautiful thing. What is that verse telling us? Come on, guys. Exactly. So what should we focus on? What, what's, what really matters? What really matters? What's inside? And, and how do you know that? What's inside? Sitting in the verse. The fear of the Lord. Who fears the Lord shall be praised. So the world praises women for their looks, for their bodies, for their image, for, for different criteria. But he, God, is telling us, don't worry about that. Charm is deceitful. Someone who is charm, that's, that's deceitful. And even if someone, say for example, you say someone, you know, people, you know, put too much makeup and that's why they look nice. But in their real life, they don't look nice. Assuming someone without makeup is so beautiful. Says he, someone is beautiful and beauty, even that is passing. Because with age, remember the story I told you two weeks ago about the old couple, remember? So you can have the most beautiful person. With age, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't have that happening all the time. So even beauty is passing. But the key here is the fear of the Lord. And the woman will be praised for the fear of the Lord, not for the beauty, not for anything else. Okay, and we'll talk about this later on because in uh, Wisdom Strike it talks later about this one. Okay. So any questions so far? 
few questions so far before I move on. Because I want to talk about some examples of um, good women in the Bible. Questions are quiet tonight. What's happened? You want to finish on time? I oh know. You don't want to miss the game. That's fine. I'll go quick. Okay. Look at verse 29. We just read. Don't you think that verse is a bit odd, like it's out of place? What, what's, what's this talking about? Verse 29. What's that? Have you thought about it? Can someone read it? Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Let's talk about someone. You get it? It's talking about lists of virtues and women doing this and then. Now it's talking about someone specific. Many, many women did well, but you excelled them all. You topped them all. Who are they talking about here? St. Mary. Excellent. This is actually a beautiful prophecy about St. Mary. All right? And we see that it was said many times later that St. Mary and God was waiting for the right time to be incarnated, was waiting in the fullness of time, as the Bible says, he was incarnated from St. Mary because he was waiting for that perfect woman to come. And that's why this is a beautiful prophecy about St. Mary, that many women did well, but you excel them all. You beat them all. Okay? See, it's a bit odd. It's out of place. So why is there? Because God was trying to say, look what we said about the virtuous woman. Look all these beautiful characteristics that needs to be present in that you know, perfect woman. Even that, there's a woman, there's one woman who exceeded them all, even topped that, even did better than that. And that's St. Mary. And St. Mary is actually honored as you know, higher than any other human being, not just human beings, even the angels. You know that? St. Mary in our church is ranked higher than the angels. So when we say praises, we say St. Mary first, and then we say angels after her. She's higher than the angel. Can you believe this? That's how virtuous she is. A human being higher than angels. That's why he said he, you excel them all. Okay? So what is the key for St. Mary's honor to that extent? What do you think was the key to St. Mary's reaching that level of honor? What did she do? Okay, excellent. What do you think? Selfless through love. Okay. Keep going. Pure heart. Excellent. Archangel. Gabriel. Excellent. She told him what? Whatever he said. I'm your maid servant. I'm your servant. Okay. So one of the her keys is humility. All you, what you said is 100% right, guys. But what we can see in St. Mary is submission. Submission to God's will. And she submitted to something that never happened before. No one ever heard of, of this scenario before, that a virgin can conceive and give birth. Not just that, give birth to God. Okay, so like it's too much to bear. And she was a young girl at that, at that time. Too much to bear. Someone, an angel appearing to her and tell her, you know, blessed are you. Too much honor. Someone who's young. You're going to give birth without a man. And that is going to be God. Too much to bear. And after all this, she still remained humble. Okay, that's why she talked them all. Her submission to the what the angel said and submission to the to the uh, will of God and her total obedience and submission and humility for God's plan in her life. Why I'm saying this is because nowadays I believe that's my person be correct me if I'm wrong that one of the main things that women cannot do is submit. And that's what the Bible clearly says, submit wife submit to your husbands. That's one of the 
the thing that lacks now. And that's why everyone laughs and everyone say, when, you know, during the matrimony service, when a Buddha says, you know, honor your, or, you know, submit to your husband, listen to your husband, and Sarah did to Abraham and called him Lord, and everyone starts laughing. I'm not going to call my husband Lord. I'm not going to submit. Why should I submit? Okay, everyone start, you know. They may not say it loud, but I know. I see people's reaction in weddings. When it comes to that part, and to the... And to be honest with you, some people think, and I heard this many times in different weddings, people saying, well, now, this is like, this is like, like we're in Australia, 2022, it doesn't fit, you know, like a wife, you know, treating a husband like that, that sort of submission, does, it's not really practical anymore. Okay, I hear that all the time, because they don't understand what that really means, okay, it's not a position of weakness, it's not like, the girl, the lady is lower than the man. It's got nothing to do with that. But someone who's higher than the angels submitted and said, I'm a servant. And she, could, she did not use her authority or her power or her status to, to do all that. So submission is so important. And that actually God's intention in the marriage. As we said before, I'm not going to dwell on it for because of time. But it's not about equality. It's not about men higher than women it's completely got nothing to do with this as we said uh, before it's based on the structure of what god created men and women to do and the different roles they play and it actually goes with equality not against equality and there was a nice um a nice quote by um pope Shenouda when you talk about equality between men and women and, and he said things to the effect that, you know, it's about roles. And, and I'll just read you some, um, uh, some of the things. Uh, just just a, a couple of sentences. He says, that they, they're equal but distinct. So men and women are equal but distinct. In their deeds, they are equal, but in their properties and responsibilities, they are different. Okay. And he's saying that equality of women and men is not realized by, you know, making women men, and but by discovering the dignity of their feminism. So we need to understand that everyone has different roles, everyone has different, ex you know, special features. We can't say they're equal, so we make them all the same. No, we're ruining that. By, by talking equality like that, we're actually ruining that nice distinction that God created. And that's where some people go wrong when it comes to submission. That's right. And this is, as I said, I said that last time as well. When, when people read that, they just read it from the part when it says the women submit. But submission is in the Lord. And that's why when we all, and that's again, it comes from the fear of the Lord. If, if God is in the picture, everything works. The reason why marriage is breakdown is God is not in the picture. It becomes man and wife, man and woman. And God is taking out of the picture. It's like my rights, your rights, you know, my thing, your thing. God is taking out of the picture. There's no fear of God anymore. And it becomes a worldly relationship. And that's why they break down. Okay, and that's why I said the fear of the Lord is the key to this. Uh, let's look at another example of a, um, a virtuous wife. Do you know the story of Abigail? You know, so Abigail, okay. Let's quickly, First Samuel 25, if you can get that on the screen. 1 Samuel 25. I love Abigail. She's a beautiful wife. 1 Samuel 25. So basically... Just a quick background before we read this, because it's a very long story. We don't have time for it. So Abigail was at the time of King David. I'm sure you know it when I tell you the story. Abigail is the time of King David. And she was married to someone, her husband called Nabal, and he was a very bad person. He wasn't good. But she was wise, okay? And because of her wisdom, she saved her husband. Okay? You know the story now? Okay? So Nabal, King David when he was, he was looking after, before, when he was running away from King Saul, he was looking after the, him and his men were looking after the sheep of uh, Nabal, the husband. And then later on, 
he sent, he was in need of some food and things because he was on the run. And he went and asked, sent his servants to ask from Nabal, can you give us, you know, we looked after your sheep and took care of it. Can you give us some, we, ne we need some food, we need some supplies. And he kicked them out, said, I don't want to give you anything, you've got nothing. Um, who, who's David? Anyway, he said, who is this David? And he sort of, he made fun of David. So David was fuming, he was so angry. And he said, that's it. I'm going to take my men, I'm going to go and kill Nabal and all his family. And how can he say this? about me and he got really really angry so he took people with him and he was heading to go to Nabal to kill him someone told Abigail that David is on his way to come and kill your husband this is what she did okay let's read together what she did first Samuel 25 from verse 23 to 35 can someone read it for us For us. Now, when Abigail saw David, she... Okay, sorry, before that, mm. she prepared, she took with her a lot of food, a lot of good stuff, and she had people with her, and she loaded good stuff, and she sent them before her in the way of David. So when David see the stuff first, and then she met him, and then that's what happened. Now, when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, and on me, on me, let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the word of your and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord, li as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from, your, and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal, as Nabal, and now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has, yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life. But the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the, of the living with the Lord your God. And the, lo and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler of Israel, that this will be no grief to you, nor, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning, light no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she brought him and said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. Thank you. What do you think of that story? I hope you're paying attention to what she did. Okay? No, I had no idea. Um, I think why there's some resistance to the concept of submission is maybe because it's misunderstood. I would have exactly. thought that submission was that even though she didn't agree with what her husband did that she followed or respected 
what he wanted to do yep. as opposed to what some would say is going behind his back and taking a different course of action. I wouldn't have called that and submission. fixing his mistakes. That's what she did. Yeah, but I wouldn't have called that submission mm. from my understanding. No, I'm, not talking about, I'm not talking about just submission here. Mm. She did many things, but mm. but that's that's one of them. But I'm not just talking about submission here. So that's an example of submission. That's an example of a, vi a wise woman, okay? A virtuous wife. So, so what she did has many of the characteristics that we talked about as a virtuous woman, not just submission, okay? So what do you think of what she did? How would you summarize that? Yeah, uh, well, I'll tell you quite quick what she did because because of time. So she got, got presents with her and she loaded them on donkeys and made them go before David, and I mean before her, so David will receive the presents. And then she went, when she saw David, she actually bowed down and knelt before him and addressed him as the Lord. And she told him, you are... You are going to be the king of Israel. You know, this person, Nabal, he's a fool, okay? You're going to have blood on your hands because of him, and this is going to be stay with you forever, you know? He is fool, but please forgive me. Put this on me, you know, for my sake, forgive him, and don't ruin your kingship by, because he was going, as you said, he's going to kill every male in his family, okay? He's going to be bloodshed, okay? He was so angry. We can use it as a lesson about anger, what can happen, but that's another story. Okay? So that's what she did. So she calmed him down, and she made him actually change his mind, and he said at the end, okay, I'm not going to kill him anymore. Okay? The question is, did the husband deserve that? Was the husband worthy that she did that for him? He was a bad person. He was fool. He did the wrong thing. Was he worthy? No. But what did she do? She still saved her husband. Can you see that? Okay. Someone would have said, well, actually, there'll be a good chance to get rid of my husband. He'll be killed. I'll be free. If you think about it, yeah? Don't you think nowadays people will do the same? It's a good chance, you know. Let someone kill him. It'll be good to get rid of him. So he was rich as well. So Nabal was rich as well. He would have inherited him. Okay. There'll be an easy way. And she has nothing to do with it. But she went out of her way. She went into much trouble trying to prevent King David from committing murder. Okay? For someone who doesn't deserve that. But she was an example of a virtuous wife. Why? Because even though her, hu her husband was bad and was not worthy, she did her part as a wise, loyal wife. Can you see that? Okay? Because some people think, okay, I'll only be good to my husband or, or wife if they're good. No. No, you do your part, you be wise, you be loyal, you do the right thing, and God will take care of the rest. Okay? If God sees you, that you fear God and you're doing the right thing, God will take care of the rest. And God did that here. I don't want you to continue so you don't know what happened after that. You know what happened after that? You don't know that? What happened the rest of the story? No? Okay, so David went back and said, okay, I'm not going to kill him. Went back, everyone went back to the home. And then later, Nabal knew what happened. He found out that David was coming to kill him. He was in a state of fear for a number of days, so scared that he actually died. He died. Died. He died. You know that? Died. See, because see, see, God is fear. Okay, so he did something wrong. So God did not want David to be his murderer because of his death. Okay, God had other plans. God saved David through that virtuous wife. And then what happened after that? What do you think after that? the story hasn't finished yet? What happened after he died? After Nabal died? What do you think? Even better. Remarried. Remarried to who? David. He said, I want you as a wife. Why? She's very wise. He said, you're wise. You saved me from committing murder. She's the best wife. She ticked the box. She's a wise wife. Okay? So after that, her husband, he, he married her. Okay? And you read that. You, if you continue the story, first time you, you know that story. Okay? So why I'm using Abigail? Because she's a true example 
of a wise wife. Okay? Because of her wisdom, she saved, you know, because David was going to kill every male in, in Nabal's house. But they didn't do anything wrong. That was, that was the, you know, that's how they used to do things. But God says, no, this person did something wrong. He deserves to die, but no one else. And not at the hands of David. He died by himself. Can you see that? And David ended up marrying someone who's wise. And Abigail was a, was a, was a, a beautiful wife. Okay, so I'm just using examples of good wives who understand what God is telling us. Okay, you know, things like that. Um, there's been other examples of, of, of wise women and, and courageous women. Do you know the story of Esther? There's a book, a whole book in Esther in the Old Testament. And this is, guys, that's why you need to know your Bible because the more you know about the Bible, the more you, you know what God wants you to do. And that's when people say, how do I know God's will for me? Read the Bible. That's, that's exactly what the Bible is there. We understand what God, how God thinks, what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he wants us to do, and what's a good example, what's a bad example. Okay, so if he encourage you to read the book of Esther, okay, and just quickly, basically Esther, um, she was a Jew, and she was, she ended up being married to a king, you know, when they, away from, from Jerusalem, in, in exile, and there was an evil person there, who's co his name is Haman, he wanted to get rid of all the Jewish people, so he went up to the king, and, you know, played in his ear and said, you know, these people are bad, these people are trying to do wrong thing, and the king was going issue, to issue a decree to get rid of all the Jewish people. So one of the Jewish people, her, her uncle, her relative, Mordecai, he went to Esther and told her, you have to save us. You're the only person that can save all the Israelites, okay? But there was one problem. No one was allowed to go in front of the king until, unless they are requested. So no one can just rock up in front of the king and say, I need to talk to you. No, you can't do that. Even his wife, the king had to request to come in front of him. Only then. Otherwise, if people just go in front of the king, the king will kill them. So she took the risk and she went in front of the king and she told him about that bad person. Anyway, read it. I don't want to ruin it for you. But what she did, she basically saved, put her life at risk to save the whole nation of Israel. And because of her wisdom, her courage, her selflessness, she actually did that. Okay, again, another example of beautiful women. See, the Bible is full of beautiful women. So when people say, you know, women don't have the role, they actually have much bigger role in the Bible than men when it comes to real, you know, standing up for the truth and, and standing up to save people. They play a huge role. They play a huge role. Okay, there's been other stories, but because of time, um, I'll let you re read that. I want to finish by one, I'll finish the chapter by one verse, which is verse 19. And then we'll, we'll, end, we'll end with it. Verse 19. Can someone read it for us, please? One verse. Can someone read it? From the wisdom of Sirach, sorry. Sorry, my, my, that's why everyone no, no one is saying it. Sorry. Uh, back to wisdom of Sirach, chapter 26. My apologies. I'll read it then, because everyone's shy. A holy and contrite wife is grace upon grace. What do you think that means? What's another word for contrite? There's different words. Righteous, excellent. 
with other, other interpretations saying modest, a modest wife, a modest woman. Okay. Saint Peter actually in, in his epistle he talked um, a lot about wives and about what God expects them to do and, and what they should sort of uh, behave and things like that. So I'll end up with this because it's uh, there's a few verses because I'm conscious of time. And we'll end with this. Okay, so you can get First Peter chapter 3. So here some, these verses talk about a modest wife. What does a modest wife look like? Okay, what should be the focus of a modest wife? So, and that's a blessing upon a pressing, a blessing or a grace upon grace. So it's something very highly uh, valued by God. So if we can read 1 Peter chapter 3 from verse 1. Can someone read for us up to verse 6, please? Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham. Yes, the, the part people don't like here. Remember? <laughs> as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, his daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Thank you. Okay. So here St. Peter is describing a, a modest wife, someone who, who has these virtues. If you look at verse 1, we talk about submissive. And, and this was very important at that time as well because there was still the faith was still new. So some people were, uh, said the wives become Christians but the husband did not convert to Christianity because that was the time when people actually started to convert from being Jewish to, to being Christian. So, for example, the wife, the, when people were married, the wife believed in Christ. She became a Christian. The husband still in the process, hasn't converted, not a Christian yet. Look what he says. He says, even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Okay. So you don't need to lecture them. You don't need to Bible bash them. You don't, you don't need to you know, give them a sermon. By your action, by your conduct, you will win your husband. You know, and talk about submission there. Okay? So this, this was common back at that time, at the, early, at the time of the early church, where there were people still converting. Okay? Look at verse 2. Okay? Observe your conduct by company with fear. Talk about the fear of God. Three, in terms of the outlook appearance, you know, as we said earlier, the adornment. Don't just make it outward. It's not about hair or wearing gold or putting on, you know, nice clothes. So what should it be? Okay. How should the woman be adorned in terms of being beautiful? Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty. So this is the beauty that God looks at. He looks at the inside beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of god okay so when you read these things you know what god values what's important okay the the gentle and quiet spirit this is very precious in the sight of god not the outward not not the clothes not the jewelry not the hair and nowadays this is what the world is trying to focus on so when you see all this you know, photos of people and, and, and all this. It's all focusing on that. As I said earlier, the checklist of the world is completely different when it comes to talk about a virtuous wife or a virtuous woman. Completely different from the checklist that we read in Proverbs 31. Completely as if they're talking different language. Okay? And as a Christian, I need to follow the checklist. This is what God says is the right thing to do. Okay? I'm not saying by any means, you know, don't take care of your outward. No, but he said... It's not that. This is not what really matters. Okay? It's not just that. Okay? It, and this is what I said, verse 3. Do not let your adornment be merely the outward. So not just the outward. So outward, you need to look nice. But what's more important, it's what's inside. 
That's what's precious in the eyes, in the sight of God. Okay? And he's saying that because this is how the holy women who trusted in God adorned themselves. Okay? That's how they did it. And he used the example of Sarah and Abraham because this is like Abraham is the father of the Jews, so he's, he's the role model for everyone. And he says, because if you do the same, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror, and do the same as this holy woman did. Okay? So if you think, uh, this is, you know, this is not fair, why he's talking about wives, if you continue from verse 7, it talks about husbands. Okay? So it's fair. So I'm just focusing on the role of wives. But if you keep going from verse 7, it says husbands likewise and gives instruction to husbands. So it, it, it balances out. It's not just, again, you know, talking to women. Okay? So I have to stop here because of time. And God willing, next week we'll start chapter 27. If you don't have any questions, we can go back and, and revisit some of, the, some of the points that we didn't have time to go in depth. Any questions, anyone? Because I know kickoff is in four minutes. Okay. Any questions? Sure. Yeah. Hmm. Mary is perfect, but she needs salvation like all of us. But the church raised her up above everyone else. But she still says, my Savior. So she called our Lord Jesus Christ my Savior. She called God the Savior. So of course, because if she, that means she didn't need salvation, which is wrong. If you don't believe that she needed salvation like all of us. Okay. Well, well, I can't say she sinned, but everyone needed salvation because we were born and inherited the original sin. So even if you don't sin, you still needed salvation because of the original sin of Adam and Eve. Okay? And this is a very important point. And that's why she said, she said, you know, my Savior, my salvation, my God and my Savior, my Son and my Savior. So she needed salvation like everyone else because even if she didn't sin, she was born with the original sin of Adam and Eve. That's another big topic, that's, but that's a summary of it. Because we we pray in the Agbeya, which says, you know, you know, when she was at the cross and, and she was she was uh, uh, looking at him and saying, you know, my savior. So she addressed him as my savior. If she didn't need salvation, why would she call him my savior? She said, your savior. You know, I'm okay. Any other question? Thank you, guys. Okay, I'll send off a prayer. And then after that, we can go down, and every, every, hopefully everything will be set up, so you can enjoy the rest of the night. And please stay with us to enjoy the rest of the night with fellowship and food, and you can watch the game down soon. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God, amen. We thank you, dear Lord, for another opportunity to stand before you tonight to benefit from your word. Help us to truly enjoy your word and go into the depth of your word. Help us to do this by spending quality time in your word, Lord. Not just to do it quickly, not just do it till we can just tick a box, but help us to go down to the depth. Only then we'll discover treasures that we never knew about before. So give us the depth in our spiritual life. Give us the depth in our relationship with you. So we don't just go on the surface, but truly understand the depth that you want us, Lord, to understand you with. It's a beautiful thing that we are called after your name as Christians, but help us to be Christ-like and to actually do, to be worthy according to our conduct, to be worthy according to the title and the name that we carry. Lord, you know our weaknesses, but we know that we are, we are weak, we are strong. We know that we sin every day, 
but we know that you give us forgiveness if we repent and come back to you. Help us to truly live a victorious life as a Christian. And no matter how many times we fall, help us to get up quickly and come back because you'll be waiting for us. And this is our faith. We ask for us to be everyone going through a difficult time, be with them, support them. Those who are searching for the truth, we ask you to reveal yourself to them and bring them to your church. So the prayers and intercessions of Mary and St. Mian and the saints of today, hear us, Lord, we pray thankfully, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, give us our trespasses, forgive those our trespasses against us, and leave us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Jesus Christ, our Lord, for thine the kingdom, power, and glory forever, amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and amen. And now, love God the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the gift and the Queen, the Holy Spirit, with you all go in peace. The peace will be with you all. Thanks so much for.